On BBC Two shortly, The Pearl of Death, another investigation for Basil Rathbone as Sherlock Holmes. This is BBC One. <laughs> The six o'clock news from the BBC with Nicholas Witchell and Andrew Harvey. Good evening. The headlines at six o'clock. A British relief worker is missing in Lebanon. Peter Coleridge disappeared yesterday afternoon. There are fears that he's become the latest foreigner to be kidnapped. The Schultz peace shuttle has resumed, but three more Palestinians have been shot by the Israelis. Peace talks in the Land Rover dispute have come to nothing. Also tonight, the victims of Zeebrugge, their fears and why they cannot forget. At sea with the Duke and Duchess, all dressed up for a supersonic show. And come out, number 26, your time is up. There are growing fears tonight that another British citizen may have been kidnapped in the Lebanon. Peter Coleridge is a relief worker with Oxfam. Yesterday afternoon, he disappeared in the city of Sidon, about 20 miles south of Beirut. As the hours have passed and no word has come from him, British diplomats and Oxfam officials have been making urgent attempts to locate him. Here, the Foreign Office says, some things happened, he's missing, and we are extremely concerned. The Foreign Office is surprised Mr Coleridge was sent to southern Lebanon. Oxfam says it was well aware of the dangers. Mr Coleridge was there, they say, to visit homes for physically and mentally handicapped children. Mr Coleridge speaks fluent Arabic and he was with a Syrian colleague when he was last seen. Two facts which it's thought could assist him. So far there's been no word, so far as we know, from any local Lebanese group. Mr Coleridge, Oxfam's Middle East coordinator, was paying his first visit in three years to the organization's Beirut office and from there inspecting relief and rehabilitation operations run by Lebanese all over the country. There are no Britons working in Lebanon for the Oxford-based organization. Mr Coleridge had arrived in Beirut by sea on Monday morning. At three o'clock on Wednesday afternoon, he telexed Oxford that all was well and he was heading south to Sidon. On Thursday morning, colleagues have told the police there, he was picked up from a meeting by Syrian-born Omar Trabulsi, Oxfam's man in Lebanon. They've not been seen since. The two men were in a city notorious for its lawlessness, with most of Lebanon's factions operating there. The fear is that they've joined at least 26 other foreigners thought to be held by kidnappers in Lebanon. Two are Britons, Journalist John McCarthy was kidnapped in Beirut in April 1986. It's thought pro-Libyan Palestinians were responsible, but there have been no claims nor demands from kidnappers. Terry Waite vanished in January last year whilst negotiating to free other hostages. Pro-Iranian Shia Muslims are the most likely kidnappers, but again, there's been absolutely no hard news of his fate. This is Keith Graves for the 6 o'clock news in the Middle East. Later in the programme, we'll have a report from Oxfam's headquarters in Oxford, where Mr Coleridge's family and friends are waiting for news of him. America's Secretary of State, George Shultz, has resumed his efforts to find a peaceful solution to the Palestinian problem. This morning, he was in Jerusalem, talking to the Israeli Prime Minister, Mr Shamir, and the Foreign Minister, Mr Perez. This afternoon, he travelled on to Syria, where he met President Assad. While Mr. Schultz talked, the violence in Israel's occupied territories continued. Two more Palestinians have been shot dead by Israeli troops on the West Bank, and a car bomb was diffused near the center of Jerusalem. Mr. Schultz went first to see the Israeli foreign minister. Eight days ago, most Middle East politicians regarded the peace initiative as mission impossible. But now the smiles told a different story. Mr. Perez confirmed that Mr. Schultz was making progress. I think we have received some very interesting ideas. Food to think in the days to come, in the very near future. The Prime Minister, Mr. Shamir, remains sceptical, but Mr. Schultz's plan is the only one on the table and can't be rejected out of hand. At the end of his fourth visit here, Mr. Schultz seemed decidedly optimistic. Good fortune. And that is what I wish to the people of Israel, to 
to the Palestinians, to the people of all of the neighboring countries that I have visited, good fortune and peace. Thank you. He then left to visit Damascus and then Cairo before flying home. The peace process now moves to Washington. When Mr. Shamir arrives in 10 days' time, he'll be presented with the American peace plan. Much of it he is not going to like, but his reaction will be mild indeed, compared with that of 70,000 of his fellow Israelis. The settlers on the occupied west bank of the Jordan will defend to the death their right to stay there. In the town of Hebron, which is holy to Jews and Muslims alike, they went ahead with their traditional Purim parade, despite an incident symptomatic of the tensions between them and the local Arabs. A 16-year-old Israeli boy was stabbed in the back. The army rounded up the usual suspects. The attack on the boy was more serious than the minor wounds he suffered, because it was a reminder of the massacres of 1929. 70 Jews were killed by Arabs the Jewish community left town. But when they returned after Israel's victory in the war of 1967, they came to stay, setting up protected communities like Kiryat Arba outside the town. If the American peace plan meant exchanging territory for peace, the settlers would be forced out again, not something they seemed prepared to accept, however great the international pressure. I don't, personally don't think that we should give a damn what the world says. I mean, when they took my grandparents off to the camps in Europe, when they burnt them in the camps, no one said anything, the world sat by and looked. Now, as far as the propaganda war, you can, uh, if we were to establish a ministry of propaganda here, who would listen to us? Who wants to listen to us? People like us, when we're low down, you know, we're the, we're the miskinny, we're the poor lot, we're the underdog. I'm sick and tired of being an underdog. Raymond Yane, once of Wilsdon in northwest London, works here helping young children to settle in. He says he expects to be doing that job long after George Schultz has retired, along with his peace plan. But other pressures are at work and may prove him wrong. Cameramen were turned back from towns where two Palestinians were killed today. Many Israelis would settle for a bargain in which territory secured a genuine peace. This is Michael Cole for the 6 o'clock news in Jerusalem. The Prime Minister said the Labour Party leader Neil Kinnock was talking claptrap when he criticised her role at the NATO summit in Brussels. She said Labour had no spine and no guts. The Prime Minister insisted she'd got exactly what she wanted at this week's summit, but Mr Kinnock claimed she had failed. Our political correspondent John Sargent reports. The Prime Minister left number 10 ready to do battle with Labour MPs who accused her of being obsessed by nuclear weapons and of flouting the spirit of the INF arms treaty. When Mr Kinnock claimed she'd even failed to meet her own objectives in Brussels, she responded with a bitter personal attack. I sat for nearly two days in NATO listening to many speeches, including some from socialist heads of government, and I haven't had such, uh, heard such claptrap as I've heard yeah. from yeah. The Conservative MP Michael Allison joined in to compare Labour with those who appeased the fascist dictators in the 1930s. Mrs Thatcher readily agreed. I think my right honourable friend is absolutely correct. No memory, no stomach, no spine, no guts. Yeah. <laughs> Personal abuse wasn't a bit surprising because Mrs. Thatcher had absolutely nothing of substance and no success to report. Uh, not much wonder, therefore, that she went for that because she sought in Brussels to get endorsement for the idea of modernizing nuclear weapons in order to multiply them. She totally failed in that objective. The other members had too much sense. And secondly, she's been holding forth on the idea that you couldn't have further nuclear arms reduction in Europe until you'd completed strategic arms reduction, chemical arms reduction, conventional arms reduction, and the other powers said no. Conservative MPs saw it quite differently. They relished Mrs Thatcher's attack on Labour's non-nuclear policy. That policy is under long-term review, but the Tories don't want to miss any chance of reminding people of an issue which they believe was a major factor in Labour's defeat at the last election. Policemen in Northern Ireland have been told to work less overtime to save money. The result, according to the Police Federation there, is that lives will be at risk. The Federation says it will cons consider suing the government for negligence if any policemen are killed. Earlier this week there was a 25% reduction in the amount of overtime being worked by some RUC officers. 
This is the most angry attack yet from RUC men on what they term the government's ludicrous sense of priorities. The Federation claims patrols will be weaker and less frequent, arms searches will be reduced, and intelligence gathering about the IRA will suffer. The union believes the overtime cuts are being imposed by the government against professional police advice. I give no warning to the government. Should just one of my members be killed or injured, the Federation will be obliged to consider whether the cutbacks constitute negligence and will have no hesitation in pursuing the matter through the courts if necessary. Nearly 13,000 full-time and reserve policemen are dedicated to restoring normal policing to Northern Ireland. Over 250 officers have been murdered since the troubles began, on patrol, in their barracks, even at home. Terrorist violence is the worst for a decade, but the police have been particularly successful in seizing arms and explosives. Tonight, the Northern Ireland Police Authority said a reduction of 7% rather than 25% in overtime was only part of a plan to use police resources efficiently, effectively and economically. One of British coal's biggest customers says it intends to buy foreign coal despite a court order to stop it buying from abroad. The South of Scotland Electricity Board says it has already signed contracts to buy coal from Australia, America and China. The board says it's being asked to pay exorbitant prices for British coal. Today's decision signals a momentous battle between British coal and the South of Scotland Electricity Board. At stake, coal mining in Scotland. At present, three out of the four remaining Scottish pits are dedicated to supplying power stations. Barony feeds Cockenzie and Salzkirth and Castle Hill supply Longanit. They seem to have been saved by the court decision. But then the Electricity Board announced that it would buy a quarter of its needs, one million tonnes, from abroad to burn in a little used power station at Kincardine, which is not part of the contract, and also burn more oil, taking no more coal from British coal after the end of this month. Unless we get uh, more economic fuel supplies than British coal prices, then we will not have a market for electricity from our Kinsey and Longanit power stations. And in that case, we would not be able to purchase any coal from the Scottish coal field. So our own interests, interests of our employees at these stations, and the interests of coal mining industry in Scotland are crucially dependent on getting more economic fuel supplies to these stations. British coal reacted with amazement to the decision. Its commercial director described it as a device to get round the court's ruling and said he didn't see how burning coal in an inefficient station plus increasing the use of oil could be cheaper than the deal it's offered. At present, British coal supplies fuel at 48 pounds a tonne, compared with prices from America, China and Australia of 40 pounds or below. But it's offered to supply half its coal at below 30 pounds a tonne. So tonight, the battle is on. It's being watched carefully by English electricity authorities who see imported coal as a way to cut their bills even though it could result in the closure of many more pits. Talks to end the Land Rover strike broke down today after just two and a half hours. The negotiations were arranged by the conciliation service ACAS, but they failed to break the deadlock. The pay dispute at the company's Solihull plant has been going on for two weeks. Management are now threatening to reduce their pay offer to the 6,000 manual workers if the strike continues. The unions hope for a breakthrough today. But despite the efforts of the conciliation service, the two sides didn't even meet face to face. The unions saw that as an opportunity missed. As far as the unions are concerned, we're uh, still in a position of uh, being prepared to negotiate. The company are taking a harder line uh, than that and, and uh, insisting that uh, as far as they're concerned, there's nothing to negotiate about. The strike's been running for two weeks since Land Rover made its final offer which management says is worth 14% over two years. The unions say it's actually 8%. Production's at a standstill. So far, the strike stopped output of vehicles worth £30 million at showroom prices. Most workers will be about £330 out of pocket, despite receiving £20 a week in strike pay. The stoppage has caused layoffs in one of Land Rover's main suppliers, but it's been less disruptive than many component firms had feared. Land Rover says the union should now hold another ballot of the workforce. The management is sticking to its tough line. 
even threatening today to reduce the offer currently on the table to compensate for the losses caused by the strike. In France, 22 people have been killed in a plane crash near Paris. The aircraft hit Paris.